We well, got 50 minutes, and we'll fill it up with as much questions as you want. I'll be around all day. Um, anything I can do to help you, but I am an extension specialist for the University of Georgia, and I cover, in addition to cotton, I cover corn and soybeans and uh, peanuts. So we can also, at some other time, we can talk about those. Because if you look, if you had told me in 2000 when I started that I would have more questions this time of year about corn and soybeans than I've had about peanuts, I'd have thought you were crazy. But what a year it was last year with peanut production, what a year it's been this year with cotton and corn, I mean with corn and soybeans. But the nice thing about cotton is that cotton's holding its own. Okay. The other thing about cotton, the reason why I'm glad you're here, the reason why it's important for you to be here, is we have some new challenges in cotton that I would never have anticipated. We've got the challenge of the loss of timid, which is huge. We've got the challenge for this target spot disease, whatever it is or it isn't, that I would never have expected. Okay? We've got those issues. Now the question is, what tools do we have available, and how can we deal with it? If we've got questions, we go along, except for you, Wilson. You know, paybacks are hell, right? So don't ask me tough questions in front of an audience. Okay? All right, so we'll get started. And um, let's see if there's anything else I need to cover. Oh, guess what I found yesterday? I don't know what you find, Bob. Pigweed. Um, pigweed. No, I didn't find pigweed, <laughs> but I found something in the same general area I found kudzu. And I didn't find dead kudzu, I found green kudzu. And guess what was on the green kudzu? I Tell me, what was on the green kudzu, John? Kudzu bugs. And they weren't sleeping, they were awake, and they were flying in my face. And guess what else was on the kudzu? I really don't care about kudzu bugs. That's, target that's spot. what it is. Target spot. No, not target spot. Rust. 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 And guess what the rust was doing? I mean, the kudzu bug, yeah, they were flying around. Okay, we're done with the kudzu bug. Probably not. What was the rust doing? It was sporulating. All right? And why is that an unusual thing for January 29th? Because they should be asleep. The kudzu bugs should be stuck in the pine trees, and the rust should be dead, and the kudzu should be frozen back. Guess what I picked in my backyard on Sunday? I don't know, Bob. What would you pick? I picked lemongrass. My wife's from the Philippines. Lemongrass is what we use. It's going to be a good year for Filipino cooking. You know why? Because this time of year, Wilson, that kudzu grass, the lemongrass, I'm getting all mixed up now, lemongrass should be frozen back, but we can still make good Filipino dishes because we get fresh lemongrass. That's bad for us in this room. The kudzu bugs, the Asian soybean rust, the lemongrass, and the green kudzu are all bad. And for cotton growers, it's bad for one main reason, that's nematodes. Okay? We need the cold weather to put those nematodes to sleep. They need to go to sleep, they need to hibernate, they need to be in the egg form, they need to not be doing it. And that's the first reason, so they're probably still active. It doesn't take many warm days. It was 85 degrees yesterday. It doesn't take many warm days. If you can't get here on time, okay? You knew, you knew that was going to happen, right? If you don't get the warm soil or the cool soils, the nematodes stay active. That's the first problem. The other problem is, is they come back sooner. And the third problem with being so warm is if the lemongrass is still alive, the kudzu is still alive, what else is still alive? Weeds that normally wouldn't be. And you talk about pigweed, Wes, that's only kind of funny to me. Because if the pigweed is out there, we know there's weeds out there that have, that are hosts for the southern root knot nematode. And so all of this stacks up to the fact is that if it stays warm, like we have here, then we can have some cold weather, but if it stays generally warm, the nematodes will be waiting for you. What was the biggest call I got in 2012 at the beginning of the season? Cotton growers. It was that so we had seen worse problem. Joe, I wasn't going to start until you got here, but I changed my mind. Um, what we can say is that the biggest complaint I had on cotton early in the season last year was early season damage from nematodes, primarily the root knot nematodes. Why? Why was there more damage on root knot nematodes on cotton early in the season last year than we've had in many years? It was warm. That's a huge factor, coupled with what, Wes? Coupled with we were missing a big friend, weren't we? And if you came in here wanting me to tell you that we're going to have... Yeah. If you come in here wanting me to tell you that because of those warm soils, we're going to have a lot of mimic this year, we're not. The word has gone cold. The line has gone cold on mimic. Thomas, I don't know anything about it. I don't know if it's going to come or not. So we're without Timic again this year. We don't have mimic. And Telone is going to be in its perpetual restricted supply. Okay. So let's talk about what we can do. I'm going to find a seat if you can. We're passing around CEU credits. And again, the only other thing I said is at the end, if you want some information, a little bit data, but still pretty good on nematodes, we've got it up here. I'm going to be talking about diseases and talking about nematodes. 
right? Let's talk about lease buys first. 2005, Wes and Gary and, and uh, Brian John, you all came to me and said, we got a new problem out there, Bob. I said, no, it's an old problem. It's just Stemphilium lease spot, right? Because I know everything. Because right? I know it's Stemphilium lease spot. There's these spores right here. And the plants start to turn red all at one time, and they look like autumn in the Appalachian Mountains, and then all the, what, all the leaves fall off at one time. And what's the cause of Stemphilium leaf spot? The underlying cause? Low oh, potassium. Either because there's not enough in the soil, or because you don't have a vehicle like the rainfall or irrigation moving up in the plant. It's not moving up in the plant <coughs> fast. Enough. And what do I say if we got Stemphilium leaf spot? Talk to Glenn Harris, manager of potassium. We can't get good results with that with a fungicide. But the agents and the consultants were persistent and polite at first. And then later they told me that, Bob, these leaves that are falling off aren't the color of red and orange and yellow like the autumn leaves. They're green. They're falling off early in the season and start from the bottom of the plant and going to the top. And what did I say that was? Still filling them leaf spot. But then when I finally made a visit to the field, we see that we got something different. Okay? The difference between stemphilium leaf spot and target spot is that target spot is not a nutritional deficiency disease. It starts from the bottom of the plant, and it is causing defoliation well before those bowls are typically mature. A lot of people say to me, if we can drop leaves in a heavy canopy, why don't we do it? It opens the airflow, we get less bowl rot, and that's true. And if I could sell you target spot and guarantee you a 20% defoliation, Wes, we would stop. I'd quit my job here, I'd sell it. But we can't. What happens? It starts out at 20%, within a week it can be 80%. Okay? So what's happening with target spot is that we now know there's a disease that was first described in 1961. It went away for close to 40 years. Over 40 years it went away and was not described again until the consultants and agents in Southwest Georgia said there's something different going on. And we finally saw, and probably convinced me, that it's not this, it's this. Okay, first question, why should premature defoliation be of any importance to you at all? Some would say, let's defoliate a little bit. Let's open the canopy up. Let's get some good airflow in there. Okay? Less bull run. The reason defoliation should matter to you is because if you lose too many leaves too early, those bowls that are being fed, they need that nutrient to develop. And the second reason is you need to have the nutrients for fiber maturation and elongation. All right? So there's good reasons we need to be worried. The second reason is why all of a sudden did we see this shift? Okay? And how are, what happened a few years ago is we shifted all from 555 to a bunch of new varieties, good varieties. Now the question is not only how important is the disease, but what are the new varieties going to be affected by? Okay? We've always had leaf spot diseases. And we've talked about stemphilium leaf spot, and stemphilium leaf spot has always been one that you as growers need to be aware of. Talk to Glenn Harris, manage your potassium. And we've had other ones out there, Cercospora, Escochita, Areola, Angular Leaf Spot, which is a big problem in the Mid-South right now, they think. I don't know how big a problem it really is, but they think it is. Okay? They think, I'll tell you what, this is what Bob says. And you can tell him I said it. They're so worried about bacterial leaf spot that I think they're missing the real important disease, which is target spot. I think they're so focused on something. So tell them I said that and they'll get mad at me. Okay? But we've got the new disease out there. And here's the impact. The dead center... It's right there, right there along the Chattahoochee River, right there in southwest Georgia, southeast Alabama, north Florida. And until recently, it was a Bob disease, it was a consultant disease, it was a Georgia, Alabama, Florida disease. But as of 2012, we were seeing yield recovery in fungicide tests in Virginia. We know it was in all these counties, or in all these states, and we know it was in Mississippi as well. Okay? So what happened? What happened in 2012? I think it's two things. First thing, with the, all the weather we had, it was a perfect condition. You're going to learn one thing that about uh, target spot, if nothing else, and that it is extremely sensitive to the environment. It takes an estimated 14 hours, 14 hours of leaf wetness to get infection to occur. So what's that mean if you've got a dry land field and poor cotton growth? You're not going to have target spot. What's it mean if you've got irrigation and real strong growth? You're probably going to have target spot. What's it mean you're going to find on the edges of the field? Not much target spot. Where are you going to find your target spot? In the middle of the field. And why does the disease seem to stop and leave the top 20% of the leaves on there? So when you drive by at 60 miles an hour, it looks like the field is good. It's only when you get out of the field that you see the leaves are gone. It's because with the air in the upper canopy, that's where you start to slow the disease down. And the weather we had last year, 
means that states that no longer believed or didn't believe it was a problem now believe it is. What can we do with fungicides? Okay, we're going to talk about what the risk is, but as of right now, there is no variety that is immune to this disease, and we can argue or we can discuss that one variety or another variety may be more susceptible, and that could be true. But what I can tell you is, I don't know a variety of cotton out there right now, nor does Austin Hagen, Alabama, or Auburn University, that doesn't need to be protected potentially, or before I say that, may have your loss. The fungicides we've got available now are Headline, BASF, Twinline, Quadris, and Tevuzol, which is Folicure, generic Folicure. Headline and Quadris are strobilurin chemistries. That is a very active fungicide for target spot, for the Coronespora. The only problem is that the same disease gets on vegetables in Florida. The same disease. And what's happened with these strobilurin chemistries in Florida? A lot of resistance has developed. We've got to be careful. Twin lines a mixture. Okay, it's a mixture of chemistry. That could be important in the future. Tepiconazole, Tebizol, generic folicure. Last year I told growers, well, if you're not sure you want to spray, because I didn't have a whole lot of confidence last year, I said, well, if you're not going to spray one of the big guns, the headline, twin line, or quadris, why don't you go out there and spray some Tebizol? Okay? Maybe it's better than nothing. This year, what I'll say is if you're going to sleep better and you want to spray it, you go ahead, but I don't think it does a whole lot. Because unfortunately, as cheap as it is, and as good a fungicide as tebiconazole is, on target spot, it was not very good. So the fungicides I would encourage you to look at right now are headline, twin line, and quadris. And in my trials, twin line is good, but believe it or not, headline with a single strobe learning chemistry is better than twin line. <coughs> twin line is still a good chemistry, but why? When you take the twin line, you take some of the headline out of it and mix it with another fungicide, and I think the headline is a stronger fungicide. What's the risk in using just headline or quadris? The resistance. But those are the fungicides we got. Jared Walls has done a lot of the work I'm going to show you. Jared, with these fungicides spraying five or six times, did you ever eliminate the disease in the field? No. No. So we either have a problem with getting the fungicide where we need it to, or the fungicides that we're relying upon right now, Wes, are not perfect. We're hoping for better. But we have not been able to eliminate the disease. We've been able to hopefully manage the disease. This is Jared's work from Stripling Irrigation Park last year. Two fields side by side trials. On the left hand side was irrigated cotton. That was growing the way we would want to grow cotton with irrigation. On the right hand side is cotton that was growing next to it. It was growing dry land. Now last year we had a lot of rainfall, didn't we? Okay. The irrigated side cotton was about this tall. The dry land cotton was about this tall. The irrigated cotton was completely closed over. The dry land cotton was easy to walk through. What you see, look across fungicide treatments there, what you see is the difference in defoliation that occurred in that field based upon our target spot. Where we had good airflow, almost no defoliation. Where we had heavy canopy, where we had good irrigation, lots. Okay? So the first thing is, more defoliation, the better your growth is. Typically, why do we irrigate cotton, Joe? <coughs> to make more money, right? Okay. So, we would expect and we would hope if you're going to put money into irrigation, you make more cotton that way. Irrigated dry. And the only difference in that field primarily, they were side by side, they were as close <coughs> to each other as this little aisle right here. The only difference was the amount of target spot out there. And you can see that we made significantly more cotton in a dry land field where we had minimal and that's why I think when someone says, I don't believe the target spot really causes a problem, I believe it does. And if you look at the best yielding treatment in both things, there were two applications of headline at the first week of bloom and the third week of bloom. In both trials, the relative relationship between fungicide treatments was similar. But between irrigated and non-irrigated, between target spot and little target spot, the difference in yield was approximately 200 pounds of length. Consultants in southwest Georgia will tell you that they believe the disease has the potential to take five to 600 pounds of lint from you. I haven't seen that, but I trust their judgment. What I can tell you is that in a worst case, uncontrolled situation, like we had at Stripling last year, the potential loss, not realized all the time, but the potential we've seen is about 200 pounds of lint. Okay? It's probably somewhere between 10 and 20% of your yield potential. It's not catastrophic, the sky is not falling with what we saw, but that's what the potential is. What do most growers who are going to spray, what do most growers have the yield potential? Somewhere between 50 and 150 pounds of land. 
except for maybe in the extreme southwest part of the state. It may be more. We get better data, maybe more. But where we are right now, and our worst case situation is 200 pounds or less. This is looking at that same trial. This is looking at the irrigation. And this is looking at the timing of fungicide. The first square, first square plus 14 days. Every 14 days, first week of bloom, first and third, first and fourth, third, third and fifth. You get the idea. Okay? And this is the amount of defoliation. Here's the untreated. The August 1st, the August 16th, and the September 10th defoliation ratings. And what you see is, in that box, our best timing for a fungicide application last year was targeted at the third week of bloom. Last year was about the third week of bloom. Now we got some benefit from going a little bit early, a one and three. And we got a little bit from going three and five, two applications. But for us, and I'll be happy to discuss with any of what you all saw last year, but for us, across trials, except in Tifton, where it came in late, but Atapolgus and in Mitchell County, that third week of bloom was where we wanted to anchor that around, anchor that application. Because that's the big question. When is the best time to irrigate? I mean, to uh, apply the fungicide. Okay. What are the two considerations you have in applying a fungicide to cotton? Well, three. First applications don't do it if you're make, not going to make money doing it, right? The second one is if you're going to apply a fungicide and you need to, to, to protect the entire plant, if you wait until you've got a complete canopy, it's too late. You're fighting to get that fungicide down. And the third thing is, is you want to make sure that you stay ahead of the disease. So my considerations are, don't apply a fungicide unless you think you've got a reasonable chance of making money. And the further you get away from southwest Georgia, the lower your risk is right now. The second thing is, if we wait to spray until we see the first sign of disease, but the canopy is so thick we can't get the fungicide down there, it really doesn't matter. Okay, so we've got to consider the growth of the crop, the bloom stage, we've got to consider what the disease is doing. What about yields? We had some problems in this trial beyond the disease. You know, sometimes when you got rank cotton running over the cotton can be a problem. Yeah, Paul. Bob, before, before y'all made your first application, did you have any target spot yes. in the plot? Yes. The question is, was there some disease in the plot? There was a little bit. <coughs> What's more, there was a little bit in the plot, correct? There was a little bit in the plot. Okay. When we sprayed the other side of the field, there was a lot. When we sprayed that first square field, there was already a lot of disease, but it didn't develop across the road, the dry land. There was a lot in there because the rotation was a little bit shorter, but it never developed. Here, there was a little bit of disease, but what's, Paul, what's amazing to me is a little bit of disease two weeks later was 40% foliation. I guess my question is, if you had no disease prior to the presence of the application, did it prolong or prevent the disease from developing for... Days. Good question. If there was no disease when I sprayed, did it prolong before you saw the disease? I don't think so. It decreased the amount of disease we saw, but I tell you what, there was nothing we did that stopped the disease. So I think an early application before disease occurred would have slowed the appearance of the disease, or slowed the development of the disease, but probably not the first appearance. Was it conventional or strip tail? Strip tail. Bob, well, what about cutting off irrigation, say, 11 o'clock a.m.? Good question. To by 6 p.m. to let it, let What it I would say to you right. is absolutely, if you're going to manage your, if you're going to manage crop growth, anything you can do to manage rank growth is going to help you. You say, well, this variety is more susceptible than that variety. Well, that may be true to a certain extent, but I think it has more to do with the growth habit of the, of the variety than anything else. Second thing is, if we want to manage the disease the best we can, let's manage leaf wetness, minimize leaf wetness. And if you can irrigate at night, or you can irrigate, so if you're irrigating during the middle of the day, what are you doing? You are continuing, it was wet all night, and then you're just keeping it wet longer. And what's the magic number for corn esper we think right now? About 14 hours. Okay, so if it's wet all night when that dew falls, and you keep it wet for another five or six hours or longer, you're creating a perfect storm. So my suggestion is get your irrigation done as soon as possible so it has as much time to dry out during the day as, as it can. Okay, good question. Yeah. Chemigation versus spray. And you know what that one What's that? You better be an easy, you better be a softball. Okay. Yeah. Chemigation versus spray. What's your thought? Chemigation versus spray. We I have done no work with chemigation. We're starting to do more work with corn. But I think the chemigation will be a good answer for it. I think it will. I think that your product, the Quadris is labeled for chemigation. I think the headline is as well. I think chemigation could be a very strong product. As long as we remember with chemigation we're not irrigating. Right. You know, that the amount of moisture you need. And it may be a better way to get it. Coverage may be better, right? Yeah, coverage may be better. Okay. But I have no that's what we're hoping to work with the uh, scripting this year, uh, is to try and come up with that. Bob, does the initial disease 
come, is it a soil yes. borne? I know it's airborne once it starts moving around, but the initial disease, is it airborne or is it moving? The initial disease, in my opinion, is comes the, the most likely way it's going to come is going to come from rain splash or irrigation splash from the debris, and that's why conservation tillage is probably more of a factor. It's going to be in the debris and rain splash, irrigation splash, is going to splash up on, on the lower leaves. So it's going to start in the lower <laughs> canopy for two reasons. First, because the spores are going to come up off the ground. The second reason, that's why rotation and tillage is a factor. The second reason is, is because that's where your best camp, your longest leaf wet is going to be in the interior. Now, that being said, is it also airborne to some degree? Yes. Not like a rust disease would be, but in a heavy winds or storm. <coughs> but the way it's spread within the field is that back and forth of those infected leaves and putting those spores up. So the fields that will be infected first or infected first will be the ones that have the soil borne. The second I believe the later fields will yep. be airborne. I believe, but, to, but you can, but no one can feel safe with that because they say, well, where did Virginia get it this year? We had obviously been in, in, in 25 years, <clears throat> and you know they were really, really heavily yep. Yeah, you can. It, it is certainly going to be blown in storms and wind, but the biggest way, the initial infection, is going to be those young plants that are getting up off the soil or off the debris. So cold weather, will it impact if you have from I mean, cold weather. freeze, will it kill it? I mean, it, won't, it, 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 it may be a little bit, but I think that these spores are probably, it's surviving in that, in that debris right now. It's not going to be, I'd say we would probably have a greater chance for having it in warm weather than we would in cold weather, but cold weather is not going to be. I just wondered if we, if we had the cold weather like to do in the Mid-South, is that a reason they're not, we're not seeing this spread more and more? It's more of a Southwest Georgia. Florida, Alabama. What I really think, I don't think that's it. I think what it is is the weather patterns off the Gulf. I think the weather patterns off the Gulf make you more sensitive, to your crops more sensitive to this. I think it's a year like 2012 where everybody got a share of rain for the most part. But I think you all always have it because of the weather patterns off the Gulf. We create it with our pivots and our humidity. You know, we create a perfect storm. Where it was for 40 years, I don't know. It wasn't me. I didn't bring it. Okay? But we got here somehow. Are there any other alternate hosts? Oh, alternate hosts. Gosh, corn esper is one of the most important pathogens in the world. We just have not had to deal with it. Tar uh, soybeans gets target spot. Peppers. Muscadine. 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 Good. I'm not sure about that one. But the good news is, the bad news is a lot of crops get it, Paul. The good news is it seems to be very specific. And it seems from looking at the work that uh, Jared did, one of other graduate students, it looks like the lineage, the genetics of the target spot we have on cotton is different. It's the same pathogen, but it's a different genetic slightly than some of the other ones on more common crops we have in the vegetables. So the good news about that is um, that the resistance may be slower to develop, things like that. But the bad news is it gets, it gets on lots of different crops. Okay. But what we're going to try to do now is figure out what's the risk to jumping from, if you got it on soybeans, jumping to uh, cotton if you got it on vegetables. Just an example, this is out of August last year. This was complicated by Stemphilium leaf spot. You open the canopy up with Stemphilium leaf spot, we had less target spot to rate. But if you look at this, in 11 out of 13 fungicide treatments that went across, we saw a numeric yield increase. Okay. Not always statistically significant, but 11 out of 13 times we saw a yield increase. And if you look at that headline, one in three, the difference between that and our untreated is about 200 pounds of so again, I can't say that it doesn't get more than that. I'm sure it does. But for us, in a worst case scenario, we're looking at about 200 pounds. Are there situations like this with twin line that's one and three? Why didn't it do better? I can't explain. You know, this is how you know I didn't make the data up. All right? I can't explain why it didn't do better, but I can say that in general, this is why I think in that area of the state and the other areas of the state, this is why I think about it. And this is the RDC pivot and tifted. Okay, right outside the door. And this disease came in late. Our best yields again were the first and third, or when we sprayed every two weeks, but it came in late. But we still get the yield benefit. Okay. So I'm not asking you every grower in this room to spray for target spot. What I am saying is that I think there's a yield benefit. If you're growing soybeans this year, every grower is growing soybeans probably needs to spray. If you're growing corn this year, every grower needs to spray. If you're growing cotton, I would say it's a 50-50 shot whether you need to spray or not. If you're in their area, it's probably 90-10. If you're up in East Georgia, it's probably 20-80, okay? But if you look at it, not everybody needs to spray. The third week of bloom last year was a thing as we could anchor around. That may change. 
But the idea is to be in early enough where you're not got complete <laughs> canopy coverage, early enough before the disease is too well established. Still fill and leaf spot, we don't need to spray for it. But with target spot, we do. 200 pound lead, in a worst case scenario, I'm trying to be conservative, Steve Brown cornered me after me, he said, you're pretty adamant about 200 pounds of lint, Bob. I said, that's what we saw in a worst case scenario. Can't say it's not more, not less, but that's where we can say what I think is a realistic expectation of bad situation. What about varieties? We can point our finger at no variety in particular and say that variety is more susceptible than everything else. Okay? This is a trial that R.J. Byrd did last year. Treated once with twin line too late in the season, we thought, to make a difference and untreated. And in six of the nine varieties, we see a numeric yield increase where you spray with a fungicide. Okay? I bet you if we spray the third week of bloom, all of the varieties were showing. And if you look at 499, yeah, there's a difference in yield, but some of the other varieties, like the Fibermax 1944, showed the biggest increase in protection. So it's not just a one variety problem. A lot of the varieties get it. And that's why I hesitate. If we all think that one variety is going to get it and nobody else is, we run the risk of missing out the opportunity. Six out of nine showed a yield increase when we sprayed when disease was already rampant in the field. Okay. Questions on that? See this, James? I'm making progress, right? If you were to ask yourself, do I need to spray for target spot? What are the factors? The highest risk factors you're going to face with target spot are rank growth, irrigation, and wet weather like we had in 2012. Those factors are going to put you on the forefront. And I should put location, 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 because the closer you are to the southwest corner of the state, the more your risk. I should have put that one up there. Reduced tillage, crop rotation, a history of disease in the field, they're also going to add to your risk. Your cotton variety, I don't want to make too much of cotton variety because if we think it's a one or two variety issue, we run the risk of not treating what we need to. But in my opinion, with the exception of location, 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 that's what your risk factor is. When would I say to spray next year? If you're going to spray, if you think you're at high risk, or your consultant says spray, your agent says spray, I would say once you start blooming, start thinking about it, look to see if you have disease, and if you're going to make an application, make sure you get good coverage before that can be covered. Do you need a second application? In some situations you do. We've got better control, better yields in some situations. Any questions about target supply? What was your rate on the headline? Six ounces. If you spray it that first week of bloom, uh, how long of control do you think you might get? Excellent question. And that's the reason why I would not automatically jump at the first week of bloom. I would say with the strobler and chemistries, you're looking about three weeks about three weeks before I would spray again. If you can hold off the third week of bloom, you might not need to spray again. Now, I don't want to miss the importance of the first week. And to be honest with you, if I told you we are 100% sure of the third week of bloom, I'd be lying to you. All we can say is the data we have, and like some of the data that Austin Hagen had, it looks pretty good. But if you go out and spray at the first week of bloom three weeks later, you may very well need another application. If you can hold off, you may or may not need another. That's what we, we've seen. If you spray the first week of bloom, if it's raining the third week of bloom, three weeks later, you can guarantee you the second spray. Yeah. Just about down in my area, you have to spray. Soybean producers, spray it late bloom, early pod stage. Corn producers, if you're approaching tassels, think about spraying. Peanut growers, 30 days after planting. Cotton growers, start to assess as you're approaching bloom. And be careful how you pull the trigger because we've only got, at most, two shots. I think, you know, I saw Summer Bob and his emails from different people across the cotton belt. A lot of emails stuff, they'd have one spot on the leaf and they were trying to decide if they needed a spray and stuff like that. I mean, down in my area, you take a grower to the field, I mean, you don't have to worry about twisting yeah. an arm to see if he's going to spray. Growers in East Georgia, growers in South Carolina, North Carolina, you know, if you got one spot on your leaf, look at your risk. You know, one spot, everybody's going to have one spot or two spots. Don't spray this because of that. Yeah. Look at the overall risk. When can, when's it too late to start spraying? I'm going to tell you what, if you've lost 20% or 30% of your canopy, you've already lost it all because it's not going to slow down. So It's a hard call, though, when the cotton starts opening on the bottom, you know, and you got, you, you've just noticed the, the yeah. target spot, and you've got some, a little bit of foliation of the cotton, some already started this seven, eight week of bloom. That's right. You know, and this, this really, dude, are you hurt? We can see a benefit. I can say we've seen a benefit as late as the sixth week of bloom. As late as a six-week as as six of bloom, I can tell you there's the potential for a benefit. 
the land. And beyond that, it's kind of, I don't know. Real quick. I can't say that it's not. And some growers are going to say, well, i got to do something. That's what we were about. i got to do something. Well, it's going to generate a crop you got in the field. you got 500 pound cotton, you're trying to make 1,000 for free. That's right. you got to look at what the, and what your potential is. That's right. Oh, yeah. 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 You said the generic folic ears in cotton, though, what about the solid beans and all this? Is it, is for it what, for target spot or for just disease control? Target and disease. For and disease and control, debucanazole has a nice fit in soybeans and corn. It's not the only, it's not, you know, it's, it's not enough in a lot of situations, but it has a nice fit. In cotton right now, I would say that it is, it's, it's labeled for rust in southwest U.S. Maybe that's where it needs to be. If you feel better about spraying it, then you can spray it. It's cheap enough. Okay. But, but I would not, I would not say I've sprayed tebiconazole on my cotton and I'm done. Okay. One thing to mention here, and I, meant, I forgot to bring the plants with me, but you can imagine if you went out in the cotton field right now and pulled up the plants and jumped back to October and had those same plants in your hands, that's what this barking problem looks like. Okay. Anybody have this problem last year? All right. What it is, is in September, October, we had cotton plants dying in the field or nearly dead, and we went to pick it. We ended up with a lot more bark, and one grower told me the cost to him was 11 cents a pound. 11 cents a pound here in Tiff County for this barking problem. What's killing plants? What's shattering those stalks so early? What kills a cotton plant in my arena? Fusarium wilt does. We've got that here, but that was not the widespread problem. Charcoal rot. Charcoal rot gets on soybeans, it gets on corn, and it gets on cotton. And I can tell you that in 20% of the samples that came to me last year, Paul, with this shattering problem, charcoal rot was associated. The other 80%, how you doing? I can't tell you exactly what the other 80% was associated with. That's the problem is what's causing the rest of the 80%. And I'll be honest with you, we don't know. But I will say we're watching it. Again, is it one variety? Is it more than one variety? We don't know, but we did see it over in several fields in this area. It's a real problem. Charcoal rot is certainly part of the problem. You're sharing wood's part of the problem. The other 80% of the time is I'm still not sure. But we do know there's a pathogen called Diplodia. And Diplodia causes significant bowl rot in cotton. This year on those shattered stalks, I saw right above the soil line a black ring of spores, and it was always, always Diplodia. So it's possible we have a new disease. But I don't know what the problem is really. Maybe we'll never see it again. We yeah. sent some bowls in, and you sent me some of the data back that said it was diplodium. The spots that we're seeing on the bowls now are completely different than what bowl rot has typically been. They're soft spots you can take and push in the side of the bowl. It's like a rotten spot on the okay. side of the bowl. It's circular. If you got that circular water-soaked bowl rot, that is bacterial. That's the same bacterial pathogen that's causing it annually spot out in the next so if you got those soft, we saw more of that last year because of the rainfall, that soft water soap lesion, that's bacterial. And what happens, if that gets in it, it causes a problem in other pathogens. I'm glad you almost said it was going to be hours. Bob, in southwest yeah. Georgia, it, was, it didn't, didn't matter about variety, but any variety that the target spot got bad, <coughs> we got paid 35 inches of rain. Yeah. And you didn't set the top foot the bowls, you just had a stalk. Yeah. You couldn't see it, number one, because of disease, number two, it was raining every day. Some varieties just didn't see it. When we were picking trials, almost every trial on three or four different farms, you could be on the picker, you may have 14 varieties in the field. When you got to those plots, the guy driving the cotton picker, he was having to stop four or five times cleaning out the heads. Yeah. The top foot was dead with that cotton. Yeah. Didn't have any proof. That's what I saw. Where's where I saw? I think a lot of the farm was coming from. That's the question. If you I could pick it out, it was always certain varieties. It was the same variety on every farm, to every trial. It was two or three varieties, and it was bad. And people ask me the relationship between target spot and all of this. I don't think there is, but I don't know. We'll keep watching. All right. You guys, a few more minutes left. I want to talk about the more important problem. It's not as showy. It's not as flashy. It's not as new, but it is the nematode problem. And the biggest problem we have now is not only the weather we're having right now. Warm weather, warm spring does not mean good things for you all as far as cotton growers. The problem is now is the workforce we used to have, which is Timic. You know, I, what I used to say, well, let's compare Timic, five pounds of and Eris and Evicta. That doesn't matter anymore, does it? The tools we've got right now are Eris, Evicta, Acceleron N from Monsanto, 
we got resistant varieties, we got telone, and we got vide. And we got some Votivo. Okay? That's what we've got. This is our tools out there. And we can make them work. The problem is if you're not using telone, our next bonus, our next amount of we'd use was Timic. We don't have that anymore. And if you weren't in a, if you were in a field where a seed treatment wasn't enough before, when you had Timic, guess what? Those nematodes don't care. It's still not enough. What we're needing to find a way to do <coughs> is to either use telone or we're trying to take a combination of varieties, vitate, seed treatments, and try and piece it all together. Okay. Show you a little bit of data. First off, what's the seed treatments are we talking about? We got the base fungicides, where we expect seedling disease to be a problem. We have additional fungicides that can go on top of it. If it's warm out there, do we expect more or less seedling disease? We expect less because the plants are growing off faster. But Rhizoctonia loves warm weather too, so we can't ignore seedling disease. But then we got these seed treatment nematicides, the Poncho Votivo, but especially the Eris and the Evicta, the Acceleron N. This is what the tool we're left with if we're not going to use Telum. Okay? And it's not enough in a lot of fields. First thing we look at is resistance. If you talk about 4288 or 5458 or 367, you'll see the word tolerance. Okay? Tolerance means it takes a punch and keeps standing up, keeps producing. <coughs> These varieties have resistance. Because they have resistance, if you plant 4288, 5458, or 367 in your field, you have less damage to the root system, and you have less nematode buildup over time. But what question do you really want to ask me? If you plant a resistant variety, you have less damage and you have less nematode, but what's the most important question? If you plant 367 versus 499, what do you want 367 to do? You want that resistance to out yield the 499. And that doesn't always happen. What I can say is you will have less nematodes and less damage, but depending upon the pressure, these resistant varieties may or may not out yield the workhorses if you treat them right. Some trial data. 2011, we look at 367 versus 375. Similar varieties from Phytogen, which was planted right out here with Philip Roberts. And our treatments were, we had a Victa, we had Dynasty, and we had a Vitate. And what we wanted to see is, does Vitate bring anything to a Victa? Does a Victa bring anything to 375 when you don't have the resistance in it? Okay. And what I can say happened there is that in this study, we had less calling on 367. We had lower nematode populations at the end of the season, where we piggybacked Vitae on top of Invicta seed treatment. We tended to have less damage and higher yield, so there was a factor in combining treatments. But still, 367. In this trial, the variety with the resistance still did better than protecting the susceptible variety with the nematicides. We did some work again this year with some a combination of varieties. 54, 58, 42, 88, 1944, 54, 45, 13, 46, 13, 48, 10, 48, 367. If you look at that chart, the blue bar is with Gaucho alone, the red bar is with Timmon. Can you look at that and tell me which varieties were more susceptible in the early season? It's easy to pick them out. 40, 1944, 54, 45, 13, 48, 10, 48. The first thing is a taller blue bar showed that these other varieties had increased resistance. That's good. But what's also good, and unfortunately we don't have Timic anymore, but when you treat them with the nematicide, you can bring the damage down. You can take a susceptible variety and bring the damage down. At the end of the season, when we're looking at the galling in the area and the galling on the roots, are still some of the varieties like 54, 45, and 13, 48 were still showing more damage. Okay? They would have more nematode counts build up. But 1944, we're not seeing quite as much damage. Sorry, I'm having to hurry through this. I'm going to get to the last topic. <coughs> this is the juveniles in the soil. You plant a resistant variety like 367, 1346, 4288. The value is not only less damage, but less nematodes in the field. What does that matter for next year? Less nematode population field. <coughs> now for the last slide, which you all care about the most. If you remember, 1944 was one of the most susceptible early in the season. How 1944 doing that trial, as far as you know? There's not an absolute correlation between resistance and yield. But what you can be assured of is that when you plant a variety, like 367, or there's 1346, less damage, less buildup, 
and less difference in yield between treated and untreated. And that's especially important when you've got a heavy unfilled population. Any questions on that? Last topic, this one I want to get to, because in a time where we're looking at how do we make cotton profitable, at a time where the nematodes don't care what the price of cotton is, they're out there to affect your cotton crop. And at a time where telone is not as plentiful as some growers would like it to be, not as plentiful as chip would like it to be. Okay? How can we manage the price of cotton, manage the nematodes, and manage the availability of telone all at the same time? And the way, one way we can do that is say we're going to only put the telone out in the field in the areas where it needs to go out. If you're a grower sitting in this room and says, I don't use telone, and I'm never going to use telone, I respect that. But if your grower sitting in this room and says, I don't use telone, I'm never going to use telone, but I got a bad nematode problem, I hope if nothing else you'll at least consider what the possibility of fuming it like telone will do. Okay? Because telone is the absolute best until we get an immune variety the absolute best way to make cotton in a difficult situation. And throughout all this, we'll be talking about three gallons per acre. Whether you're putting it out at plant, like you can do in Georgia now, we've got an at plant application, 2 double E label, or whether you're putting out 10 to 14 days, or whether you're going to put out telling today for next spring, it's all three gallons per acre we're using right now. And that's what we'll be talking about. Site specific application simply says let's put the telone out. Is spend the money where we most need it. And you've seen this slide before you've seen me talk. This is the picture postcard. This is a, a picture perfect for Georgia. This field is just south of us right now. Bigger blue dots means more root knot nematodes. And where are the more root knot nematodes going to be? The hyper, heavier populations are going to be sandier soil, the lighter soil. Lighter color, lighter soil, more nematodes. How can we capitalize upon that? We're using less tone, telone, making more money. If we put the telone out where it needs to go, in those heavier areas, then we'll make more money because we only treat where it needs to be treated. We use seed treatment other ones. What's the only problem with that? I can show you this map right here, and it looks real nice. We've got the lines, and you can say, oh, Bob's going to put telone out at uh, zone three, but not at zone one. It's real easy in a picture, but does it work? The site-specific application will work for growers in South Georgia. We know it does in Louisiana where they got 15 different soil types in the field. Does it work for growers in South Georgia where it's mostly sand? Okay. That's what we want to look at. What we want to look at is, does site-specific application of telone as a nematicide work for growers in Georgia where our difference in soil texture is very small compared to what it is in South Carolina or in Louisiana and Arkansas? The funny thing is, if you go to those states, that's where it should work, that's where it does work, and not many growers have adopted it. You come to South Georgia where we got the big nematode problems, we got more and more growers adopting this because of the opportunity it provides. So what we're looking at is can we do it effectively? I don't want to tell you to use less telone if you needed more telone. And can we do it? Do we underestimate the populations? I'm going to treat part of the field because Bob said to, but I really should have treated the whole field. Or are we putting telone out in fields where Bob says we should put it out, but I really wouldn't make any money doing it. Because there's no point in putting telone out if we're not going to make money. Okay? We work with Diagra Science on this. I'm going to show you five fields. We had five fields where we had the southern root knot nematode. We varied the fields. We used soil conductivity to figure out what this particle size was. Debbie Waters created a risk management zone. She looked at the difference in soil texture, the soil conductivity, and said, this is a lighter soil, this is a heavier soil. She drew a map. And then based upon those risk zones, we fumigated with telone. We either put telone across the entire strip, we didn't put any out at all, or we applied it based upon her risk management zone. So no telone, all telone, or just where she told me we thought we needed it. This map is the result of soil conductivity. Heavier soils are in red, lighter soils are in pink. This was her risk management zone. If it's red up there, that's where Debbie said, based upon my map, her map, not my map, she said, if it's red, we're going to treat it. And our test area was in that green bracket. We took it to yield. Here's our strip through the field. Either tell on the entire strip, no tell on the entire strip, or treat it only within that strip based upon her recommendation. Okay. We come up with in each field. We come up with blue bar. This is a low risk area where we didn't put telone. A red bar is a high risk area where we did put telone. 
a yellow, no, I'm sorry, blue bar is low risk notellum, red bar is high risk notellum. So what do you expect? There should be a lot more damage in a red zone than a blue zone. A yellow bar is low risk where we put telon out anyway, and a green bar is where we had a high risk to put telon out. And just to confuse you even more, here's the pattern we can spend. Think about my hand like this, cupped hand. That's the shape of this chart for growth and yield. If this works, we should have the highest growth and yield where we didn't have a problem or didn't perceive a problem, and where we put telon out. We should have the lowest growth in the yield in the red bar. That's where we need to tell them, but we didn't put it out. If it works, that should be the pattern. And the other one should be like a finger pointing up. For your nematode damage, if this works, you should have more damage, more nematodes, where we should have put tell out, where we didn't, than in a low risk area, or where we put tell Does that make sense? No tell and needed it, you should have more damage. So let's look at the field. Colquitt County, we didn't have any nematodes early this season. Didn't see them. Late in the season in Colquitt County, What's our pattern here? Here it's a U. It didn't work as far as the nematodes right there. Okay? The red bar for nematodes should be high risk. We should be more nematodes. We didn't prove the concept here. With the horn field, again, the red bar is actually smaller than the blue bar. We did not accurately define where the nematodes were. My gosh, I'm thinking now all this worked for nothing. Chip's going to kill me. Okay? We come here early season in Worth County. Again, the blue bar is no different than the red bar, in some cases, and higher. We're still not seeing that pattern that I'm looking for. Uh, now we come to Worth County, the Charity Grove Field and Sheffield Church. We're seeing more damage. That red bar is taller. We're seeing more nematode populations late in the season. So we're starting to see some. What's the problem with basing all this upon nematode counts last year? When you took nematode counts last year, what was your biggest problem? It got dry. And when it gets dry, your nematode counts are not very good. So let's look at gall ratings. Because again, why am I showing you this? What I'm showing you is if this is going to be a way to save you money and make you cotton, it's got to work. We've got to be able to show it. And again, when we look at the number of galls per root system, uh, we don't have to count the nematodes now. We're counting the galls. That red bar is taller. The bar fields farm, it worked well. The horn field, not so much. So we've got a big success there. When we look at the bar field site late in the season, again, we are accurately predicting where the nematode damage is going to be, low risk versus high risk. When we look at Shiver Point, perfect example. The biggest nematode populations where we did not put telone out and where we expect it to be high. Okay. Last couple slides. Shoot height. Remember, you're looking for the U. Okay. The growth should be better where either you have a low risk or you put telone out, and lower where you don't. The red bar is lower, that's our high risk no telone, high risk no telone, and both fields at work. And at the Shiver point, it worked well. Our best growth was where we had low risk or where we put telone out. You follow me? So when it comes to growth, three of the five fields, the growth fit the pattern that we wanted it to. We put telone out where we thought we needed it. The soil counts were a little bit off. The gall counts were pretty much online. The growth is online, but what's most important is the yield. Last two slides. At the bar field site, this is picture perfect. Blue and yellow are low risk. Our yields fit perfectly where we anticipated they would. We saw a drop in yield. That's high risk with telone, but we saw an improvement over having high risk without telone. Horn field simply says the more telone you add, you're going to see an increase. You probably should tell them the whole field there. Shiver Point and Sheffield again. What we're seeing is we're accurately predicting how you will be affected by the use of a site specific application. Lower, disease, lower yields where we didn't put the telone out, we predicted those were the zones that would be. Okay. So, how do I sum it up? Is that confusing? What gives us to cut to the chase? Five fields. And two of the five fields, the site-specific application of telling would have made you money by accurately depicting where the nematode should be. The bar field site and Shiver Point accurately depicted what we wanted. We had some success in the Horn Field and the Sheffield Field in Seminole County, but in those fields we could have probably gotten away with rather than treating only part of it, we could have tried the whole field. And definitely at Charity Grove we should have treated the whole field. So was it a success? At this point in time, we had no failure. We had no failure with it. 
But what I would say is we need to refine how we are defining these maps. And maps were good, but we can make them better. If any grower in this room says that they want to go out and try site-specific applications, we had a number of growers do it last year, not a single complaint came back. Not a single grower came back and said, I should have treated the whole field. And if you ask me, when we are confident with the maps, we are very accurate with them. But we need to get better at creating these maps to make sure that you don't need to treat the whole field as opposed to just part of the field. I'm going to stop there. A lot of people helped with this. Are there any questions before I turn you loose on the target spot or on the nematodes or site specific applications? Looking at the various rigs compared in soil types to actual numbers of nematodes, how accurate or can you give a percentage uh, based on what Debbie did or y'all did as far as soil type uh, correlating with numbers of nematodes? Excellent question. Okay. How good does the various rig? If you are a grower or you're a consultant who simply wants to various rig the field, and base all of your site-specific mapping on that, I think it's a mistake. The various rig, there's a step in between, there's an inconvenient step in between various rigging and drawing a map, and that is soil sampling to ground truth. Because there could be some fields that don't have nematodes, or there could be some fields where you can draw a map and the various data says, here's where it is, I'm going to go ahead and treat this way, but the nematodes don't know the difference. Because we're dealing with small differences, sometimes, like at the, at the uh, one of those fields, we should treat the whole field, despite her ability to draw a map. For other fields, where the difference is greater, and we can look at the nematodes, it works very well. So simply going from a various rig map <coughs> to a prescription map, you skip an important step. How many samples would you say would need to be taken in a field on an acre basis? Uh, you know, if you had a 100 acre field, how many nematode samples, or how many, you know, <coughs> you read it all? That's a good question. First off, I would sample based upon the, the zones. You know, I'd make sure I knew where the zones were. And um, that's, a, that's a complicated question. But I would say if you get it into samples within one acre block or something like that, that should be. As long as we're sampling within the zone, I think that would be good. It's expensive. Okay? But the good news is once you ground truth at one time, you've done it once. I mean, you've done it. You're going to go in a just say you broke the field up into quarters and you sampled in those quarters and you determined you had nematodes in you know all four quarters would you treat the whole field based on if that? you break it into quarters we could but if you break it into quarters and you treat the whole field because you got nematodes and all things you lose the opportunity for the site specific because all you've done is break it into geographical regions as opposed to say what is the soil type or if you broke it into soil types and sampled all the soil if you broke it into soil types that's a better way to do it it's not quite as good as this. If you take yield maps and treat where you had low yield, that's a way you can do it. Right? But this is hopefully taking away to very specifically say where the nematode types are based on the soil types. So who interprets the data in the very little? Oh, that's right. If you say, does, does, does site specific applications work in Georgia? Absolutely, 100% of the time it does. Well, Bob, why did you get 50% here where you said it worked very well, 50% where you said I would use <coughs> the whole field? I would say it comes down to the artistic interpretation. And that's as we get better and better at interpreting these maps well, because we're trying to. One thing too, with various, just because you got a reading of a two in the same field, <clears throat> that reading of a six on one side of the field, even though it's heavy dirt, there's still nematodes there. Exactly. It's just, it's, you just can't just look at the EC data. If anybody bases all their prescriptions simply on the EC data, it's a mistake because the nematodes may not know the difference between the two and the six. I say it's a big difference. Louisiana what, what says would you say the break in the break? Is? Stop just right there before people get there. If anybody needs to go now, that's fine. I'll stay around and ask questions, answer questions. We've got some books up here. We've got the uh, CEU or CCU going around. I appreciate it, but I'll stand here and answer questions if anybody's got them. So.